Section 29 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 4, by Anonymous. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Wainwright The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night Volume 4 Translated by Richard Burton Section 29 When it was the three hundred and twenty-eighth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Mushrur cried out to the caliph o oh, my lord strike off my head aptly that i will dispel thine unease and do away the restlessness that is upon thee so al rashid laughed at his saying and said see which of the boon companions is at the door thereupon he went out and returning said o oh, my lord he who sits without is Ali bin Masur of Damascus, the wag. Bring him to me, quoth Harun. And Mushroor went out and returned with Ibn Masur, who said on entering, Peace be with thee, O commander of the faithful. The caliph returned his salutation and said to him, O Ibn Masur, tell us some of thy stories. Said the other, O commander of the faithful, shall I tell thee what I have seen with my eyes, or what I have heard only? Replied the caliph, If thou have seen aught worth telling, let us hear it. For hearing is not like seeing. Said Ibn Masur, O commander of the faithful, lend me thine ear and thine heart. And he answered, O Ibn Masur, behold, I am listening to thee with mine ears, and looking at thee with mine eyes, and attending to thee with my heart. So Ibn Masur began, Know then, O commander of the faithful, that I receive a yearly allowance from Muhammad bin Suleiman al-Hashmi, Sultan of Basra. So I went to him once upon a time, as usual, and found him ready to ride out, hunting and a-birding. I saluted him, and he returned my salute, and said, O son of Masur, mount and come with us to the chase. But I said, O oh my Lord, I can no longer ride, so do thou station me in the guest house, and give thy chamberlains and lieutenants charge over me. And he did so, and departed for his sport. His people entreated me with the utmost honor, and entertained me with the greatest hospitality. But I said to myself, By Allah, it is a strange thing that for so long I have been in the habit of coming from Baghdad to Basra, yet know no more of this town than from palace to garden and from garden to palace. When shall I find an occasion like this to view the different parts and quarters of Basra? I will rise forthwith and walk forth alone and divert myself and digest what I have eaten. Accordingly, I donned my richest dress and went out a-walking about Basra. Now, it is known to thee, O commander of the faithful, that it hath seventy streets, each seventy leagues long, the measure of Iraq. And I lost myself in its by-streets, and thirst overcame me. Presently, as I went along, O prince of true believers, behold, 
I came to a great door, whereupon were two rings of brass, with curtains of red brocade drawn before it, and on either side of the door was a stone bench, and over it was a trellis, covered with a creeping vine that hung down and shaded the doorway. I stood still to gaze upon the place, and presently heard, a sorrowful voice, proceeding from a heart which did not rejoice, singing melodiously and chanting these sinquains. My body bides the sad abode of grief and malady, caused by a fawn whose land and home are in a far country. O ye two zephyrs of the wold, which caused such pain in me, by Allah, Lord of you, to him my heart's desire, go ye, and chide him so perchance, ye soften him, I pray, and tell us all his words, if he to hear your speech shall deign, and unto him the tidings bear of lovers twixt you twain and both vouchsafe to render me a service free and vain and lay my case before him showing how i ever complain and say what ails thy bounder thrall this wise to drive away without a fault committed and without a sin to show, or heart that leans to other white, or would thy love forego, or treason to our plighted throff, or causing thee a throw. And if he smile, then say ye twain in accents soft and slow, and thou to him a meeting grant twould be the kindest way for he is gone distraught for thee as well indeed he might his eyes are wakeful and he weeps and wails the lifelong night if seen he satisfied by this why then tis well and right but if he show an angry face, and treat ye with despite, trick him, and not we know of him, I beg you both to say. Quoth I to myself, Verily, if the owner of this voice be fair, she co-joineth beauty of person, and eloquence, and sweetness of voice, then I drew near the door, and began raising the curtain, little by little, when, lo, I beheld a damsel, white as a full moon, when it mooneth on its fourteenth night, with joined eyebrows, twain and languorous, lids of vine, breast like pomegranates, twin, and dainty, lips like double carnaline, her mouth as it were the seal of Solomon, and teeth ranged in a line that played with the reason of Prosser and Rhymer, even as saith the poet, O pearly mouth of friend, who set those pretty pearls in line, and filled thee full of whitest chamomile and reddest wine. Who lent the morning glory in thy smile to shimmer and shine? Who with the ruby padlock dared thy lips to seal and sign? Who looks on thee at early morn with stress of joy and bliss? Goes mad for I. What then of him who wins a kiss of thine? 
and saith another, O pearl set forth a friend, pity poor ruby's cheeks, boast not over one who owns the union and unique. In brief, she comprised all varieties of loveliness, and was a seduction to men and women. Nor could the gazer satisfy himself with the sight of her charms, for she was as the poet hath said of her, when she comes, slays she, and when back he turns, she makes all men regard with loving eyes, a very sun, a very moon, but still from hurt and harmful ills her nature flies, opes Eden's garden, when she shows herself, and full moon see we over her necklace rise. How, as I was looking at her through an opening of the curtain, behold, she turned, and seeing me standing at the door, said to her handmaid, See who is at the door. So the slave girl came up to me and said, O oh, Sheikh, hast thou no shame? Or do impudent airs suit hoary hairs? Quoth I, O oh, my mistress, I confess to the hoary hairs, but as for impudent airs, I think not. To be guilty of unmannerliness, then the mistress broke in, and what can be more unmannerly than to intrude thyself upon a house other than thy house, and gaze on a harem other than thy harem? I pleaded, O oh, my lady, I have an excuse. And when she asked, And what is thine excuse? I answered, I am a stranger, and so thirsty that I am well nigh dead of thirst. She rejoined, We accept thine excuse. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the three hundred and twenty-ninth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the young lady rejoined, we accept thine excuse, and, calling one of her slave-maids, said to her, O Luth, give him to drink in the golden tankard. So she brought me a tankard of red gold, set with pearls and gems of price, full of water, mingled with virgin musk, and covered with a napkin of green silk. And I addressed myself to drink, and was long about my drinking, for I stole glances at her the while, till I could prolong my stay no longer. Then I returned the tankard to the girl, but did not offer to go. And she said to me, O oh, Sheikh, wind thy way. But I said, O oh, my lady, I am troubled in mind. She asked me, What for? And I answered, For the turns of time, and the change of things. She replied, Well, mayest thou be troubled thereat, for time breedeth wonders. But what hast thou seen of such surprises, that thou shouldest muse upon them? Quoth I, I was thinking of the whilom owner of this house, for he was my intimate in his lifetime, Asked she, What was his name? And I answered, Muhammad bin Ali, the jeweler, and he was a man of great wealth. Tell me, did he leave any children? She said, Yes, he left a daughter, Budur by name, who inherited all his wealth. Quoth I, Me, seem that thou art his daughter. Yes, answered she, laughing. 
then added, O oh, Sheikh, thou best talked long enough. Now wind thy ways. Replied I, Needest must I go, but I see thy charms are changed by being out of health. So tell me thy case. It may be that Allah will give thee comfort at my hands, rejoined she. O oh, Sheikh, if thou be a man of discretion, I will discover to thee my secret. But first, tell me who thou art, that I may know whether thou art worthy of confidence or not. For the poet saith, None keepeth a secret but a faithful person, with the best of mankind remaineth concealed. I have kept my secret in a house with a lock, whose key is lost, and whose door is sealed. There, too, I replied, O oh, my lady, and thou wouldest know who I am? I am Ali bin Masur of Damascus, the wag, cup companion to the commander of the faithful, Harun al Rashid. Now, when she heard my name, she came down from her seat and saluting me said, Welcome, O Ben Masur. Now will I tell thee my case and entrust thee with my secret. I am a lover separated from my beloved. I answered, O my lady, thou art fair and shouldest be on love terms with none but the fair. Whom then dost thou love? Quoth she, I love Jabbar bin Umar al-Shabani, emir of Banu Shaban. And she described to me a young man than whom there was no prettier fellow in Basorah. I asked, O oh my lady, have interviews or letters passed between you? And she answered, Yes, but our love was tongue love souls, not heart and souls. Love, for he kept not his trust, nor was he faithful to his troth. Said I, O oh my lady, what was the cause of your separation? And she replied, I was sitting one day whilst my handmaid here combed my hair. When she had made an end of combing it, she plaited my tresses, and my beauty and loveliness charmed her. So she bent over me and kissed my cheek. At that moment he came in unawares, and seeing the girl kiss my cheek, straightways turned away in anger, vowing eternal separation, and repeating these two couplets. If another share in the thing I love, I abandon my love, and live lorn of love. My beloved is worthless, if aught she will, save that which her lover doth most approve. And from that time he left me to this present hour, O Ibn Masur, he hath neither written to me nor answered my letters. Quoth I, And what purpose thou to do? Quoth she, I have a mind to send him a letter by thee. If thou bring me back an answer, thou shalt have five hundred gold pieces, and if not, then an hundred for thy trouble in going and coming. I answered, Do what seemeth good to thee. I hear, and I obey thee. Whereupon she called to one of her slave girls, 
Bring me ink, case, and paper. And she wrote thereon these couplets. Beloved, why this strangeness? Why this hate? When shall thy pardon reunite us two? Why dost thou turn from me in severance? Thy face is not the face I am wont to know. Yes, slanderers, false to my words, and thou to them inclining, may despite and envy grow. In hast believed their tale, the heavens forbid. Now thou believe it when dost better bow. By thy life, tell what hath reached thine ear. Thou knowest what said they, and so justice show. And it be true, I spoke the words, my words, admit, interpreting, and change allow. Given that the words of Allah were revealed, folk changed the Torah, and still changing go. What slanderers told they of mankind before? Jacob heard Joseph blamed by tongue of foe. Yea, for myself and slanderer and thee, an awful day of reckoning there shall be. Then she sealed the letter and gave it to me, and I took it and carried it to the house of Jabbar ben Omar, whom I found absent a hunting. So I sat down to wait for him, and behold, he returned from the chase, and when I saw him, O prince of true believers, come riding up, my wit was confounded by his beauty and grace. As soon as he sighted me sitting at the house door, he dismounted, and coming up to me, embraced me and saluted me, and me seemed I embraced the world and all therein. Then he carried me into his house, and seating me on his own couch, called for food. They brought a table of cowlange wood and corazon with feet of gold, whereon were all manners of meat, fried and roasted and the like. So I seated myself at the table, and examining it with care, found these couplets engraved upon it, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the three hundred and thirtieth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Ali, son of Masur, continued. So I seated myself at the table of Jabbar bin Umar al-Shabani, and, examining it with care, found these couplets engraved upon it. On these, which once were chicks, your morning glances fix, late dwellers in the mansion of the cup, now nearly eaten up. Let tears bedew the memory of that stew. Those portraits once roast, now lost. The daughters of the grouse in plaintive strain be mourn and still be mourn and mourn again the children of the fry we lately saw half smothered in palu with buttery mutton fritters smoking by alas my heart the fish who filled his dish with flaky form in varying colors spread on the round pastry cake of household bread. Heaven sent us that kebab, for no one could, save heaven, he should rob, produce a thing so excellently good, or give us roasted meat 
with basting oil so savorly replete. But, oh, mine appetite, alas, for thee, who on that firm meaty so sharp set west a little while ago, that firm meaty which mashed by hands of snow a light reflection bore of the bright bracelet that those fair hands wore again remembrance glads my sense with visions of its excellence again i see the cloth unrolled rich work in many a fairied fold be patient o oh, my soul they say fortune rules all that's new and strange and though she pinches us to-day to-morrow brings full rations and a change then said jabbar put forth thy hand to our food and ease our heart by eating our victual answered i by a law i will not eat a mouthful till thou grant me my desire he asked what is thy desire so i brought out the letter and gave it to him but when he had read it and mastered its contents he tore it in pieces and throwing it on the floor said to me o ibn masur i will grant thee whatever thou askest save thy desire which concerneth the writer of this letter for i have no answer to her at this i rose in anger but he caught hold of my skirts saying o ibn masur i will tell thee what she said to thee albeit i was not present with you i asked and what did she say to me and he answered did not the writer of this letter say to thee, If thou bring me back an answer, thou shalt have of me five hundred ducats, and if not, an hundred for thy pains? Yes, replied I, and he rejoined, Abide with me this day, and eat, and drink, and enjoy thyself, and make merry, and thou shalt have thy five hundred ducats. So I sat with him, and ate, and drank, and made merry, and enjoyed myself, and entertained him with talk deep into the night, after which I said to him, O oh, my master, is there no music in thy house? He answered, Verily, for many a day we have drunk without music. Then he called out, saying, Ho! Shah Jarat al Dur, whereupon a slave girl answered him from her chamber and came in to us with a lute of Hindu make, wrapped in a silken bag, and she sat down and laying the lute in her lap, preluded in one and twenty modes. Then, returning to the first, she sang to a lively measure these couplets we have ne'er tasted of love's sweets and bitter draught no difference kins twixt presence bliss and absence stress and so who hath declined from love's true road no difference kins twixt smooth and ruggedness i ceased not to oppose the votaries of love till I had tried its sweets and bitters, not the less. How many a night my pretty friend conversed with me, and sipped I from his lips, honey of love, lice. Now have I drunk its cup of bitterness until, to bond man and to freed man, I have proved me base. How short-aged was the night together we enjoyed, when seemed it daybreak, came on nightfall's heel to press. But fate 
had vowed to disunite us lovers twain and she too well hath kept her vow that votaress fate so decreed it none her sentence can withstand where is the wit who dares oppose her lord's command hardly had she finished her verses when her lord cried out with a great cry and fell down in a fit whereupon exclaimed the damsel may allah not punish thee old man this long time have we drunk without music for fear the like of this falling sickness befall our lord but now go thou to yonder chamber and there sleep so i went to the chamber which she showed me and slept till the morning when behold a page brought me a purse with five hundred dinars and said to me this is what my master promised thee but return thou not to the damsel who sent thee god let it be as though neither thou nor we had ever heard of this matter hearkening and obedience i answered and taking the purse went my way still i said to myself the lady must have expected me since yesterday, and by Allah there is no help, but I return to her and tell her what passed between me and him. Otherwise she will revile me and revile all who come from my country. So I went to her and found her standing behind the door, and when she saw me, she said, Ibn Masor, thou hast done nothing for me? I asked, Who told thee of this? And she answered, O Ibn Masor, yet another thing has been revealed to me, and it is that when thou handest him the letter, he tore it in pieces, and throwing it on the floor, he said to thee, O Ibn Masor, I will grant thee whatever thou askest, save thy desire concerning the writer of this letter for i have no answer to her missive then didst thou rise from beside him in anger but he laid hold of thy skirts saying o son of masur abide with me to-night for thou art my guest and eat and drink and make merry and thou shalt have five hundred ducats so thou didst sit with him eating and drinking and making merry and entertainest him with talk deep into the night and a slave girl sang such an air and such verses whereupon he fell down in a fit so commander of the faithful i ask her wist thou then with us and she answered o ibn masur hast thou not heard the saying of the poet the hearts of lovers have eyes akin which see the unseen by vulgar men however o ibn masur the night and day shift not upon anything but they bring to it change and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say end of section twenty nine read by simon wainwright Section 30 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 4, by Anonymous. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Griffin. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 4, translated by Richard Burton. Section 30, 331st Night to 333rd Night. When it was the three hundred and thirty-first night, she said, 
It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the lady exclaimed, O Ibn Mansur, the night and the day shift not upon anything, but they bring it to change. Then she raised her glance to heaven and said, O my God and my leader and my Lord, like as thou hast afflicted me with love of Jubair bin Umair, even so do thou afflict him with love of me, and transfer the passion from my heart to his heart. Then she gave me an hundred sequins for my trouble in going and coming, and I took it and returned to the palace, where I found the sultan coming home from the chase. So I got my pension of him and fared back to Baghdad. And when next year came, I repaired to Basara as usual to seek my pension, and the sultan paid it to me. But as I was about to return to Baghdad, I bethought me of the Lady Budur, and said to myself, By Allah, I must needs go to her, and see what hath befallen between her and her lover. So I went to her house, and finding the street before her door swept and sprinkled, and eunuchs and servants and pages standing before the entrance, said to myself, Most like grief hath broken the lady's heart, and she is dead, and some emir or other hath taken up his abode in her house. So I left it, and went to the house of Jubair, son of Umair, the Shaibani, where I found the benches of the porch broken down, and there a page at the door as of want, and said to myself, Haply, he too is dead. Then I stood still before the door of his house, and with my eyes running over with tears, bemoaned it in these couplets. O lords of me, who fared, but whom my heart e'er followeth, Return, and so my festal days with you shall be renewed. I stand before the home of you, bewailing your abode. Quiver mine eyelids, and my eyes with tears are ever dewed. I ask the house and its remains that seem to weep and wail. Where is the man who will am want to lavish goods and good? It saith, Go, wend thy way. Those friends like travellers have fared from springtide camp and buried lie of earth and worms the food. Allah ne'er desolate us, so we lose their virtue's light in length and breadth, but ever be the light in spirit viewed. As I, O prince of true believers, was thus keening over the folk of the house, behold, out came a black slave therefrom, and said to me, Hold thy peace, O sheikh, may thy mother be reft of thee. Why do I see thee bemoaning the house in this wise? Quoth I, I frequented it of yore, when it belonged to a good friend of mine. Asked the slave, What was his name? And I answered, Jubair bin Umair the Shaibani. Rejoined he, And what hath befallen him? Praise be Allah, he is yet here with us, in the enjoyment of property and rank and prosperity, except that Allah hath stricken him, with love of a damsel called the Lady Budur, and he is so whelmed by his love of her and his longing for her that he is like a great rock cumbering the ground. If he hunger, he saith not, Give me meat, nor if he thirst, doth he say, Give me drink. Quoth I, Ask leave for me to go in to him, said the slave. O oh, my lord, wilt thou go in to one who understandeth, or to one who understandeth not? And I said, there is no help for it, but I see him, whatever be the case. Accordingly he went in to ask, and presently returned with permission for me to enter, whereupon I went in to Jubair, and found him like a rock that cumbereth the ground, understanding neither sign nor speech, and when I spoke to him he answered me not. Then said one of his servants, O oh my lord, if thou remember aught of verse, repeat it, and raise thy voice and he will be aroused by this and speak with thee. So I versified in these two couplets. Hast quit the love of moons, or dost persist? Dost wake o' nights, or close in sleep thine eyes? If I thy tears in torrents flow, then learn eternal thou shalt dwell in paradise. When he heard these verses, he opened his eyes and said, Welcome, O son of Mansur! Verily, the jest is become earnest. Quoth I, O oh my lord, is there aught thou wouldst have me do for thee? Answered he, Yes, I would fain write her a letter and send it by thee. 
If thou bring me back her answer, thou shalt have of me a thousand dinars, and if not, two hundred for thy pains. So I said, Do what seemeth good to thee. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the three hundred and thirty-second night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Ibn Mansur continued. So I said, Do what seemeth good to thee. Whereupon he called to one of his slave-girls, Bring me ink-case and paper, and wrote these couplets. I pray in Allah's name, O princess mine, be light on me, for love hath robbed me of my reason's sight, slaved me this longing, and enthralled me love of you, and clad in sickness garb, a poor and abject wight, I want, ere this, to think small things of love, and hold, O princess mine, to a silly thing and over slight. But when it showed me swelling surges of its sea, to Allah's hest I bowed and pitied lover's plight. And will you pity show and deign a meeting grant? And will you kill me? Still forget not good requite. Then he sealed the letter and gave it to me. So I took it, and, repairing to Budur's house, raised the door-curtain little by little, as before, and looking in, behold, I saw ten damsels, high-bosomed virgins like moons, and the lady Budur, as she were the full moon among the stars, sitting in their midst, or the sun, when it is clear of clouds and mist, nor was there on her any trace of pain or care. And as I looked and marvelled at her case, she turned her glance upon me, and, seeing me standing at the door, said to me, Welcome, and welcome and all hail to thee, O Ibn Mansur. Come in. So I entered, and saluting her gave her the letter. And she read it, and when she understood it, she said laughingly to me, O Ibn Mansur, the poet lied not when he sang. Indeed, I'll bear my love for thee with firmest soul, until from thee to me shall come a messenger. Look ye, O Ibn Mansur, I will write thee an answer, that he may give thee what he promised thee. And I answered, Allah requite thee with good. So she called out to a handmaid, Bring ink case and paper, and wrote these couplets. How comes it I fulfilled my vow, the while that vow broke you? And seen me lean to equity, iniquity wrought you. Twas you initiated wrongest dealing and despite. You were the treachetor, and treason came from only you. I never ceased to cherish mid the sons of men my troth, And keep your honour brightest bright, and swear by name of you, Until I saw with eyes of me what evil you had done, Until I heard with ears of me what foul report spread you. Shall I bring low my proper worth, while raising yours so high? By Allah, had you me eke, I had honoured you. But now, uprooting severance, I will fain console my heart, And wring my fingers clean of you for evermore to part. Quoth I, By Allah, O oh my lady, Between him and death there is but the reading of this letter. So I tore it in pieces, and said to her, Write him other than these lines. I hear and obey, answered she, and wrote the following couplets. Indeed I am consoled now, and sleep without a tear, and all that happened slandering tongues have whispered in mine ear, my heart obeyed my hest, and soon forgot thy memory, and learnt mine eyelids t'was the best to live in severance sheer, he lied who said that severance is a bitterer thing than gall. It never disappointed me. Like wine I find it cheer. I learnt to hate all news of thee, in mention of thy name, and turn away and look thereon with loathing pure and mere. Look ye, I cast thee out of heart and far from vitals mine. Then let the slanderer wot this truth, and see I am sincere. Quoth I, by Allah, O oh my lady, when he shall read these verses, his soul will depart his body. Quoth she, 
Oh, Ibn Mansur, is passion indeed come to such a pass with him that thou sayest this thing? Quoth I, had I said more than this, verily it were but the truth. But mercy is in the nature of the noble. Now when she heard this, her eyes brimmed over with tears, and she wrote him a note, I swear by Allah, O commander of the faithful, there is none in thy chancery could write the like of it. And therein were these couplets. How long shall I thy coyness and thy great aversion see? Thou hast satisfied my censurers, and pleased their enmity. I did amiss, and wot it not. So deign to tell me now what so they told thee. Haply, twas the merest calumny. I wish to welcome thee, dear love, even as welcome I sleep to these eyes, and eyelids in the place of sleep to be. And since tis thou hast made me drain the unmixed cup of love, if me thou see with wine bemused, heap not thy blame on me. And when she had written this missive, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the three hundred and thirty-third night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Budur had written the missive, she sealed it and gave it to me. And I said, O oh, my lady, in good sooth, this thy letter will make the sick man whole and ease the thirsting soul. Then I took it and went from her. When she called me back and said to me, O oh, son of Mansur, say to him, She will be thy guest this night. At this I joyed with exceeding great joy, and carried the letter to Jubair, whom I found with his eyes fixed intently on the door, expecting the reply. And as soon as I gave him the letter, and he opened and read it and understood it, he uttered a great cry and fell down in a fainting fit. When he came to himself, he said to me, O oh, Ibn Mansur, did she indeed write this note? with her hand, and feel it with her fingers? Answered I, O oh my lord, do folk write with their feet? And by Allah, O commander of the faithful, I had not done speaking these words, when we heard the tinkle-tinkle of her anklets in the vestibule, and she entered. And seeing her, he sprang to his feet, as though nothing pained or ailed him, and embraced her like the letter L embraceth the letter A and the infirmity that erst would not depart at once left him. Then he sat down, but she abode standing, and I said to her, O oh, my lady, why dost thou not sit? Said she, O oh, Ibn Mansur, save on a condition that is between us, I will not sit. I asked, And what is that? And she answered, None may know lover's secrets and putting her mouth to Jubair's ear, whispered to him, whereupon he replied, I hear, and I obey. Then he rose, and said somewhat, in a whisper to one of his slaves, who went out and returned in a little while with a kazi and two witnesses. Thereupon Jubair stood up, and taking a bag containing an hundred thousand dinars, said, O kazi, marry me to this young lady, and write this sum to her marriage settlement quoth the kazi to her, Say thou, I consent to this. I consent to this, quoth she. Whereupon he drew up the contract of marriage, and she opened the bag, and taking out a handful of gold, gave it to the kazi and the witnesses, and handed the rest to Jubair. Thereupon the kazi and the witnesses withdrew, and I sat with them in mirth and merriment, till the most part of the night was past, when I said in my mind, these are lovers, and they have been this long while separated. I will now arise and go sleep in some place so far from them, and leave them to their privacy, one with other. So I rose, but she caught hold of my skirt, saying, What thinkest thou to do? Nothing but so and so, answered I. Upon which she rejoined, Sit thee down, and when we would be rid of thee, we will send thee away. So I sat down with them till near daybreak. When she said to me, O oh, Ibn Mansur, go to yonder chamber, for we have furnished it for thee, and it is thy sleeping place. Thereupon I arose and went thither, and slept till morning, when a page brought me basin and ewer, 
and I made the ablution, and prayed the dawn prayer. Then I sat down, and presently, behold, Jubair and his beloved came out of the bath in the house, and I saw them both wringing their locks. So I wished them good morning, and gave them joy of their safety and reunion, saying to Jubair, That which began with constraint and conditions hath ended in cordial contentment. He answered, Thou sayest well, and indeed thou deservest thy honorarium. And he called his treasurer, and said, Bring hither three thousand dinars. So he brought a purse containing the gold pieces, and Jubair gave it to me, saying, Favor us by accepting this. But I replied, I will not accept it, till thou tell me the manner of the transfer of love from her to thee, after so huge an aversion. Quoth he, Hearkening and obedience. Know that we have a festival called New Year's Day, when all the people fare forth and take boat and go up pleasuring on the river. So I went out with my comrades and saw a skiff, wherein were ten damsels like moons, and amongst them the Lady Budur lute in hand. She preluded in eleven modes, then, returning to the first, sang these two couplets. Fire is cooler than fires in my breast, Rock is softer than the heart of my lord. Marvel I that he's formed to hold in water-soft frame Heart rock-hard. Said I to her, Repeat the couplets in the air. But she would not. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, And ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 30 Section 31 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 4, by Anonymous. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Griffin. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 4, translated by Richard Burton. Section 31, 334th Night to 336th Night. When it was the three hundred and thirty-fourth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Jubair continued. So I cried to her, Repeat the couplets in the air. But she would not. Whereupon I bade the boatmen pelt her with oranges, and they pelted her till we feared her boat would founder. Then she went her way, and this is how the love was transferred from her heart to mine. So I wished them joy of their union, and, taking the purse with its contents, I returned to Baghdad. Now when the caliph heard Ibn Mansur's story, his heart was lightened, and the restlessness and oppression from which he suffered forsook him. And they also tell the tale of the man of Al-Yaman and his six slave girls. The caliph Al-Mamun was sitting one day in his palace surrounded by his lords of the realm and officers of state, and there were present also before him all his poets and cup companions, amongst the rest one named Mohammed of Basura. Presently the caliph turned and said to him, O Mohammed, I wish thee forthwith to tell me something that I have never before heard. He replied, O commander of the faithful, dost thou wish me to tell thee a thing I have heard with my ears, or a thing I have seen with my eyes. Quoth Al-Ma'amun, Tell me whichever is the rarer. So Mohammed al-Basri began, Know then, O commander of the faithful, that there lived once upon a time a wealthy man, who was a native of Al-Yaman. But he emigrated from his native land, and came to this city of Baghdad whose sojourn so pleased him that he transported hither his family and possessions. Now he had six slave-girls, like moons one and all, the first white, the second brown, the third fat, the fourth lean, the fifth yellow, and the sixth lamp-black, and all six were comely of countenance and perfect in accomplishments, and skilled in the arts of singing and playing upon musical instruments. Now it so chanced that one day he sent for the girls and called for meat and wine, and they ate and drank and were mirthful and made merry. Then he filled the cup, 
and, taking it in his hand, said to the blonde girl, O oh, new moon face, let us hear somewhat of thy pleasant songs. So she took the lute, and, tuning it, made music thereon, with such sweet melody that the place danced with glee, after which she played a lively measure, and sang these couplets. I have a friend whose form is fixed within mine eyes, whose name deep buried in my very vitals lies. When as remembers him my mind, all heart am I, and when on him my gaze is turned, I am all eyes. My censor saith, Forswear, forget the love of him. What so is not to be, how shall's be? My reply is. Quoth I, O censor mine, go forth from me avaunt, and make not light of that on human heavy lies. Hereat their master rejoiced, and, drinking off his cup, gave the damsels to drink, after which he said to the berry brown girl, O brazier light, and joy of the sprite, let us hear thy lovely voice, whereby all that hearken are ravished with delight. So she took the lute, and thereon made harmony till the place was moved to glee. Then, captivating all hearts with her graceful swaying, she sang these couplets. I swear by that fair face's life I'll love but thee, Till death us part, nor other love but thine I'll see. O full moon, with thy loveliness mantillador, The loveliest of our earth beneath thy banner be. Thou, who surpassest all the fair in pleasantness, May Allah, Lord of worlds, be everywhere with thee. The master rejoiced, and drank off his cup, and gave the girls to drink, after which he filled again, and, taking the goblet in his hand, signed to the fat girl, and bade her sing, and play a different motif. So she took the lute, and striking a grief-dispelling measure, sang these couplets, An thou but deign consent, O wish to heartified, I care not wrath and rage to all mankind betide. And if thou show that fairest face which gives me life, I reck not and diminished heads the kings go hide. I seek thy favours only from this versal world, O thou in whom all beauty cloth firm fixed abide. The man rejoiced, and, emptying his cup, gave the girls to drink. Then he signed to the thin girl, and said to her, O Uri of Paradise, Feed thou our ears with sweet words and sounds. So she took the lute, and, tuning it, preluded, and sang these two couplets. Say me, on Allah's path, hast death not dealt to me, turning from me, while I to thee turn patiently. Say me, is there no judge of love to judge us twain, and do me justice wronged, mine enemy, by thee? Their lord rejoiced, and, emptying the cup, gave the girls to drink. Then, filling another, he signed to the yellow girl, and said to her, O son of the day, let us hear some nice verses. So she took the lute, and, preluding after the goodliest fashion, sang these couplets. I have a lover, and when drawing him, he draws on me a sword-blade glancing grim. Allah avenge some little of his wrongs, who holds my heart, yet wrecks or bearing whim. Oft though I say, renounce him heart, yet heart will to none other turn excepting him. He is my wish and will of all men, but fate's envious hand to me's I grudging him. The master rejoiced, and drank, and gave the girls to drink. Then he filled the cup, and taking it in hand signed to the black girl, saying, O pupil of the eye, let us have a taste of thy quality, though it be but two words. So she took the lute, and tuning it, and tightening the strings, preluded in various modes, then returned to the first, and sang to a lively air these couplets. Ho ye mine eyes, let prodigal tears go free, this ecstasy would see my being unbe. All ecstasies I dree forsake a friend, I fondle, maugre enviers jealousy. Censors forbid me from his rosy cheek, Yet e'er inclines my heart to rosary. Cups of pure wine, time was, Went circuiting in joy, What time the lute sang melody, 
while kept his troth the friend who madded me, yet made me rising star of bliss to see. But, with time, turned he not by sin of mine, then such a turn can aught more bitter be. Upon his cheek there grows and glows a rose, nay, too, whereof grant Allah one to me. And were prostration by our law allowed to aught but Allah, at his feet I had bowed. Thereupon rose the six girls, and, kissing the ground before their lord, said to him, Do thou justice between us, O our lord. So he looked at their beauty and loveliness, and the contrast of their colors, and praised Almighty Allah, and glorified him. Then said he, There is none of you but hath learnt the Koran by heart, and mastered the musical art, and is versed in the chronicles of yore, and the doings of peoples which have gone before. So it is my desire that each one of you rise, and, pointing finger at her opposite, praise herself, and dispraise her co-concubine. That is to say, let the blonde point to the brunette, the plump to the slenderer, and the yellow to the black girl, after which the rivals, each in her turn, shall do the like with the former, and be this illustrated with citations from holy writ, and somewhat of anecdotes, and verse, so as to show forth your fine breeding and elegance of your pleading. And they answered him, We hear and we obey. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the three hundred and thirty-fifth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the handmaids answered the man of Al-Yaman, We hear and we obey. Accordingly, the blonde rose first, and, pointing at the black girl, said to her, Out on thee, blackamoor! It is told by tradition that whiteness saith, I am the shining light, I am the rising moon of the fourteenth night. My hue is patent, and my brow is resplendent, and of my beauty quoth the poet, White girl with softly rounded polished cheeks, as if a pearl concealed by beauty's boon, her stature alif-like, her smile like meme, and o'er her eyes two brows that bend like noon. Tis as her glance were arrow, and her brows bows ever bent to shoot death dart eft soon. If cheek and shape thou view, there shalt thou find rose, myrtle, basil, and narcissus wown. Men want in gardens plant, and set the branch. How many garths thy stature branch cloth own! So my colour is like the hale and healthy day, and the newly culled orange spray, and the star of sparkling ray. And indeed, quoth Almighty Allah, in his precious book to his prophet Moses, on whom be praise, Put thy hand into thy bosom, it shall come forth white without hurt. And again he saith, But they whose faces shall become white, shall be in the mercy of Allah, therein shall they remain for ever. My colour is a sign, a miracle, and my loveliness supreme, and my beauty a term extreme. It is on the like of me that raiment showeth fair and fine, and to the like of me that hearts incline. Moreover, in whiteness are many excellences. For instance, the snow falleth white from heaven, and it is traditional that the beautifulest of all colours is white. The Muslims also glory in white turbans. But I should be tedious, were I to tell all that may be told in praise of white. Little and enough is better than too much of unfilling stuff. So now I will begin with thy dispraise, O black, O colour of ink and blacksmith's dust, thou whose face is like the raven which bringeth about the parting of lovers. Verily, the poet saith in praise of white and blame of black, Seest not that pearls are prized for milky hue? But with a dirham by we coals in load. And while white faces enter paradise, Black faces crowd Gehenna's black abode. And indeed it is told in certain histories, Related on the authority of devout men, That Noah, on whom be peace, Was sleeping one day, With his sons Cham and Shem seated at his head, 
when a wind sprang up, and, lifting his clothes, uncovered his nakedness, whereat Cham looked and laughed and did not cover him. But Shem arose and covered him. Presently their sire awoke, and, learning what had been done by his sons, blessed Shem and cursed Cham. So Shem's face was whitened, and from him sprang the prophets and the orthodox caliphs and kings, whilst Cham's face was blackened, and he fled forth to the land of Abyssinia, and of his lineage came the blacks. All people are of one mind in affirming the lack of understanding of the blacks, even as saith the adage, How shall one find a black with a mind? Quoth her master, Sit thee down, thou hast given us sufficient, and even excess. Thereupon he signed to the negress, who rose, and, pointing her finger at the blonde, said, Dost thou not know that in the Koran sent down to his prophet and apostle is transmitted the saying of God the Most High, By the night, when it covereth all things with darkness, by the day, when it shineth forth? If the night were not the more illustrious, verily Allah had not sworn by it, nor had given it precedence of the day. And indeed all men of wit and wisdom accept this. Knowest thou not that black is the ornament of youth, and that, when hoariness descendeth upon the head, delights pass away, and the hour of death draweth in sight? Were not black the most illustrious of things, Allah had not set it in the core of the heart, and the pupil of the eye. And how excellent is the saying of the poet, I love not black girls, but because they show youth's color, tinct of eye and heart-core's hue. Nor are in error who unlove the white, and hoary hairs and winding sheet a shoe. And that said of another, Black girls, not white, are they, all worthy love I see. Black girls wear dark brown lips, whites blotch of leprosy. And of a third, Black girls in acts are white, and tis as though like eyes with purest shine and sheen they show. If I go daft for her, be not amazed. Black bile drives melancholic mad, we know. Tis as my colour with a noon of night, for all no moon it be, its splendours glow. Moreover, is the foregathering of lovers good but in the night? Let this quality and profit suffice thee. What protecteth lovers from spies and censors, like the blackness of night's darkness? And what causeth them to fear discovery, like the whiteness of the dawn's brightness? So, how many claims to honour are there not in blackness? And how excellent is the saying of the poet, I visit them, and night black lendeth aid to me, seconding love. But Don White is mine enemy. And that of another. How many a night I've passed with the beloved of me, While gloom with dusky tresses veiled our desires. But when the morn light showed, it caused me sad affright, And I to morning said, Who worship light are liars. And saith a third, He came to see me, hiding neath the skirt of night, Hasting his steps, as when did he in cautious plight. I rose and spread my cheek upon his path like rug, Abject, and trailed my skirt to hide it from his sight. But rose the crescent moon, and strave its best to show The world our loves like nail-slice raying radiant light. Then what befell befell, I need not aught describe. But think thy best, and ask me not of wrong or right. Meet not thy lovers save at night, for fear of slander. The sun's a tittle-tattler, and the moon's a pander. And a fifth. I love not white girls blown with fat who puff and pant. The maid for me is young brunette, emben point scant. I'd rather ride a colt that's darn upon the day of race, and set my friends upon the elephant. And a sixth. My lover came to me one night, and clips we both with fond embrace, and lay together till we saw the morning come with swiftest pace. 
Now I pray Allah and my Lord to reunite us of his grace, and make night last me long as he lies in the arms that tightly lace. Were I to set forth all the praises of blackness, my tale would be tedious. But little and enough is better than too much of unfulfilling stuff. As for thee, O blonde, thy colour is that of leprosy, and thine embrace is suffocation, and it is of report that hoar-frost and icy cold are in Gehenna for the torment of the wicked. Again, of things black and excellent is ink, wherewith is written Allah's word. And were it not for black ambergris and black musk, there would be no perfumes to carry to kings. How many glories I may not mention dwell in blackness, and how well saith the poet, Seest not that musk, the nut-brown musk, e'er claims the highest price, whilst for a load of whitest lime none more than dirham bids? And while white speck upon the eye deforms the loveliest youth, black eyes discharge the sharpest shaft in lashes from their lids. Quoth her master, Sit thee down, this much sufficeth. So she sat down, and he signed to the fat girl, who rose. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the three hundred and thirty-sixth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the man of Al-Yaman, the master of the handmaids, signed to the fat girl, who rose, and— pointing her finger at the slim girl, bared her calves and wrists, and uncovered her stomach, showing its dimples and the plump rondure of her navel. Then she donned a shift of fine stuff that exposed her whole body, and said, Praised be Allah who created me, for that he beautified my face and made me fat and fair of the fattest and fairest and likened me to branches laden with fruit, and bestowed upon me abounding beauty and brightness, and praised be he no less, for that he hath given me the precedence, and honoured me, when he mentioneth me in his holy book. Quoth the Most High, and he brought a fatted calf, and he hath made me like unto a verger full of peaches and pomegranates. In very sooth, even as the townsfolk long for fat birds, and eat of them and love not lean birds, so do the sons of Adam desire fat meat, and eat of it. How many vauntful attributes are there not in fatness! And how well, saith the poet, Farewell thy love, for see the kafilas on the move. O oh man, canst bear to say adieu and leave thy love? Tis as her going were to seek her neighbour's tent, The gate of fat fair maid, whom hearts shall all approve. Sawest thou ever one stand before a flesh's stall, But sought of him fat flesh? The wise say, Joyance is in three things, eating meat, and riding meat, and putting meat into meat. As for thee, O thin one, thy calves are like the shanks of sparrows, or the pokers of furnaces, and thou art a cruciform plank of a piece of flesh, poor and rank. There is not in thee to gladden the heart. Even as saith the poet, With Allah take I refuge from whatever driveth me To bed with one like foot-rasp, or the roughest ropery. In every limb she hath a horn that butteth me, Whene'er I fain would rest. So morn and eve I wend me wearily. Quoth her master, Sit thee down, this much sufficeth. So she sat down, and he signed to the slender girl, who rose as she were a willow wand, or a rattan frond, or a stalk of sweet basil, and said, Praised be Allah who created me, and beautified me, and made my embraces the end of all desire, and likened me to the branch whereto all hearts incline. 
If I rise, I rise lightly. If I sit, I sit prettily. I am nimble-witted at a jest, and merrier soul than mirth itself. Never heard I one describe his mistress, saying, My beloved is the bigness of an elephant, or like a mountain long and broad. But rather, my lady hath a slender waist and a slim shape. Furthermore, a little food filleth me, and a little water quencheth my thirst. My sport is agile, and my habit active, for I am sprightlier than the sparrow, and lighter skipping than the starling. My favours are the longing of the lover, and the delight of the desirer, for I am goodly of shape, sweet of smile, and graceful as the bending willow wand, or the rattan cane, or the stalk of the basil plant." nor is there any can compare with me in loveliness. Even as saith one of me, Thy shape with willow branch I dare compare, and hold thy figure as my fortunes fair. I wake each morn distraught and follow thee, and from the rival's eye in fear I fare. It is for the like of me that amorists run mad, and that those who desire me wax distracted. If my lover would draw me to him, I am drawn to him, and if he would have me inclined to him, I incline to him, and not against him. But now, as for thee, O oh, fat of body, thine eating is the feeding of an elephant, and neither much nor little filleth thee. When thou liest with a man who is lean, he hath no ease of thee, nor can he anyways take his pleasure of thee, for the bigness of thy belly holdeth him off from going in unto thee and the fatness of thy thighs hindereth him from coming at thy slit. What goodness is there in thy grossness, and what courtesy or pleasantness in thy coarseness? Fat flesh is fit for naught but the flasher, nor is there one point therein that pleadeth for praise. If one joke with thee, thou art angry, if one sport with thee, thou art sulky, if thou sleep, thou snorest, if thou walk, thou lollest out thy tongue, if thou eat, Thou art never filled. Thou art heavier than mountains, and fouler than corruption and crime. Thou hast in thee nor agility, nor benedicite, nor thinkest thou of aught save meat and sleep. When thou pissest, thou swishest, and if thou turd, thou gruntest like a bursten wineskin, or an elephant transmogrified. If thou go to the water-closet, thou needest one to wash thy gap, and pluck out the hairs which overgrow it. And this is the extreme of sluggishness, and the sign outward and visible of stupidity. In short, there is no good thing about thee, and indeed the poet title of thee, Heavy and swollen like a urine bladder blown, With hips and thighs like mountain propping piles of stone, When as she walks in western hemisphere, Her tread makes the far eastern world with weight to moan and groan. Quoth her master, Sit thee down, this sufficeth. So she sat down, and he signed to the yellow girl, who rose to her feet, and praised Allah Almighty, and magnified his name, calling down peace and blessing on Mohammed, the best of his creatures, after which she pointed her finger at the brunette, and said to her, And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 31 Recording by Griffin This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Section 32 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 4, by Anonymous. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 4, translated by Richard Burton. Section 32. Three hundred and thirty seventh night to three hundred and thirty ninth night. When it was the three hundred and thirty seventh night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the yellow girl stood up and praised Almighty Allah and magnified his name, 
after which she pointed her finger at the brown girl and said to her i am the one praised in the koran and the compassionate hath described my complexion and its excellence over all other use in his manifest book where allah saith a yellow pure yellow whose color gladdeneth the beholders wherefore my color is a sign and portent and my grace is supreme and my beauty a term extreme for that my tint is the tint of a ducat and the color of the planets and moons and the hue of ripe apples my fashion is the fashion of the fair and the dye of saffron outvieth all other dyes so my semblance is wondrous and my color marvellous i am soft of body and of high price comprising all qualities of beauty my color is essentially precious as virgin gold and how many boasts and glories cloth it not unfold of the like of me quoth the poet her golden yellow is the sheeny suns and like gold sea queens she delights the sight saffron small portion of her glance can show nay she outweighs the moon when brightest bright and i shall at once begin in thy dispraise o berry brown girl thy tincture is that of the buffalo and all souls shudder at thy sight if thy color be in any created thing it is blamed if it be in food it is poisoned for thy you is the you of the dung fly it is a mark of ugliness even in dogs and among the colors it is one which strikes with amazement and is of the signs of mourning never heard i of brown gold or brown pearls or brown gems if thou enter the privy thy color changeth and when thou comest out thou addest ugliness to ugliness thou art a nondescript neither black that thou mayst be recognized nor white that thou mayst be described and in thee there is no good quality even as says the poet the hue of dusty motes is hers that dull brown hue of hers is mouldy like the dust and mud by cossid's foot upthrown i never look upon her brow e'en for eye twinkling space but in brown study fall i and my thoughts take browner tone quoth her master sit thee down this much sufficeth so she sat down and he signed to the brunette now she was a model of beauty and loveliness and symmetry and perfect grace soft of skin slim of shape of stature rare and coal-black hair with cheeks rosy pink eyes black rimmed by nature's hand face fair and eloquent tongue moreover slender waisted and heavy hip so she rose and said praise be to allah who hath created me neither leper white nor bile yellow nor charcoal black but hath made my color to be beloved of men of wit and wisdom for all the poets extol berry brown maids in every tongue and exalt their color over all other colors to brown of you they say praise is due and allah bless him who singeth and in brunettes is mystery couldst thou but read it right thy sight would never dwell on others be they red or white free-flowing conversation amorous coquettishness would teach harut himself a mightier spell of magic might and said another give me brunettes so limberlissome lithe of sway brunettes tall slender straight like samhar's nut-brown lance languid of eyelids and with silky down on either cheek who fixed in lover's heart work to his life mischance and yet another now by my life brown you hath point of comeliness leaves whiteness nowhere and high o'er the moon takes place but an of whiteness ought it borrowed self to deck twould change its graces and would pale for its disgrace not with his must i'm drunken but his locks of musk are wine in ebriating all of human race his charms are jealous each of each and all desire 
to be the down that creepeth up his lovely face and again another why not incline me to that show of silky down on cheeks of dark brunette like bamboo spiring brown when as high rank in beauty poets sing they say brown aunt like specklet worn by nenuphar in crown and see i sundry lovers tear out others eyne for the brown mole beneath that yet deep pupil shone then why do censors blame me for one all a mole allah i pray demolish each molesting clown my form is all grace and my shape is built on heavy base kings desire my color which all adore rich and poor i am pleasant active handsome elegant soft of skin and prized for price eke i am perfect in seemly bead and breeding and eloquence my aspect is comely and my tongue witty my temper is bright and my play a pretty sight as for thee thou art like unto a mallow growing about the loop gate in you sallow and streaked yellow and made all of sulphur aroint thee o copper worth of jaundiced sorrow o rust of brass pot o face of owl in gloom and fruit of the hell tree sakum whose bedfellow for heartbreak is buried in the tomb and there is no good thing in thee even as saith the poet of the like of thee yellowness tincturing her though nowise sick or sorrow straightens my hapless heart and makes my head sore ache and thou repent not soul i'll punish thee with kissing her lower face that shall mine every grinder break and when she ended her lines quoth her master sit thee down this much sufficeth and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the three hundred and thirty-eighth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that when the yellow girl ended her recitation quoth her master sit thee down this much sufficeth then he made peace between them and clad them all in sumptuous robes of honour and hanselled them with precious jewels of land and sea and never have i seen o commander of the faithful any when or anywhere aught fairer than these six damsels fair now when al maumun heard this story from mohammed of bassorah he turned to him and said o mohammed knowest thou the abiding place of these damsels and their master and canst thou contrive to buy them of him for us he answered o commander of the faithful indeed i have heard that their lord is wrapped up in them and cannot bear to be parted from them rejoined the caliph take thee ten thousand gold pieces for each girl that is sixty thousand for the whole purchase and carry the coin to his house and buy them of him so muhammad of bassorah took the money and betaking himself to the man of al jaman acquainted him with the wish of the prince of true believers he consented to part with them at that price to pleasure the caliph and dispatched them to al maamun who assigned them an elegant abode and therein used to sit with them as cup companions marvelling at their beauty and loveliness at their varied colours and the excellence of their conversation thus matters stood for many a day but after a while when their former owner could no longer bear to be parted from them he sent a letter to the commander of the faithful complaining to him of his own ardent love-longing for them and containing amongst other contents these couplets captured me six all bright with youthful glee then on all six be best salams from me they are my hearing seeing very life my meat my drink my joy my jollity i'll never forget the favours erst so charmed whose loss hath turned my sleep to insomny alack o long some pining and o tears would i had farewelled all humanity those eyes with bowed and well arched eyebrows dight like bows have struck me with their archery 
now when the letter came to the hands of al ma'amun he robed the six damsels in rich raiment and giving them three score thousand dinars sent them back to their lord who joyed in them with exceeding joy more especially for the monies they brought him and abode with them in all the comfort and pleasance of life till there came to them the destroyer of delight and the severer of societies and men also recount the tale of harun al rashid and the damsel and abu novas the caliph commander of the faithful harun al rashid being one night exceedingly restless and thoughtful with sad thought rose from his couch and walked about the byways of his palace till he came to a chamber over whose doorway hung a curtain he raised that curtain and saw at the upper end of the room a bedstead whereon lay something black as it were a man asleep with a wax taper on his right hand and another on his left and as the caliph stood wondering at the sight behold he remarked a flagon full of old wine whose mouth was covered by the cup the caliph wondered even more at this saying how came this black by such wine service then drawing near the bedstead he found that it was a girl lying asleep there curtained by her hair so he uncovered her face and saw that it was like the moon on the night of his fullness so the caliph filled himself a cup of wine and drank it to the roses of her cheeks and feeling inclined to enjoy her kissed a mole on her face whereupon she started up from sleep and cried out o oh, trusted of allah what may this be replied he a guest who knocketh at thy door hoping that thou wilt give him hospitality till the dawn and she answered even so i will serve him with my hearing and my sight so she brought forward the wine and they drank together after which she took the lute and tuning the strings preluded in one and twenty modes then returning to the first played a lively measure and sang these couplets the tongue of love from heart bespeaks my sprite telling i love thee with love infinite i have an eye bears witness to my pain and fluttering heart sore hurt by parting plight i cannot hide the love that harms my life tears ever roll and growth of pine i sight i knew not what love was ere loving thee but alas destiny to all is dight and when her verses were ended she said o commander of the faithful i have been wronged and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the three hundred and thirty-ninth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that the damsel cried o commander of the faithful i have been wronged quoth he how so and who hath wronged thee quoth she thy son bought me a while ago for ten thousand dirhams meaning to give me to thee but thy wife the daughter of thine uncle sent him the said price and bade him shut me up from thee in this chamber whereupon said the caliph ask a boon of me and she i ask thee to lie with me to-morrow night replied the caliph inshallah and leaving her went away now as soon as it was morning he repaired to his sitting-room and called for abu novas but found him not and sent his chamberlain to ask after him the chamberlain found him in a tavern pawned and pledged for a score of a thousand dirhams which he had spent on a certain beardless youth and questioned him of his case so he told him what had betided him with the comely boy and how he had spent upon him a thousand silver pieces whereupon quoth the chamberlain show him to me and if he be worth this thou art excused he answered patience and thou shalt see him presently as they were talking together up came the lad clad in a white tunic under which was another of red and under this yet another black now when abu nova saw him he sighed a loud sigh and improvised these couplets 
He showed himself in shirt of white, with eyes and eyelids langer digit. Quoth I, Dost path and greet me not, though were thy greeting a delight? Blessed he who clothed in rose thy cheeks, creates what wills he by his might. Quoth he, Leave prate for sure, my lord, a work is wondrous infinite. My garments like my face and luck, all three are white on white on white. When the beardless one heard these words, he doffed the white tunic and appeared in the red, and when Abu Nova saw him, he redoubled in expressions of admiration, and repeated these couplets. He showed in garb anemone red, a foeman friend in tituled. Quoth I in marvel, Thou'rt full moon, whose weed shame rose, however red. Hath thy cheek stained it red, or hast dyed it in blood by lover's blood? Quoth he, Sol gave me this for shirt, when hasting down the west to bed. So garb and wine and dew of cheek, all three are red on red on red. And when the verses came to an end, the beardless one doffed the red tunic and stood in the black. And when Abu Nova saw him, he redoubled in attention to him and versified in these couplets. He came in sable hued sack and shone in dark men's heart to rack quoth i does pass and greet me not joying the hateful envious pack thy garments like thy locks and like my lot three blacks on black on black seeing this state of things and understanding the case of abu novas and his love longing the chamberlain returned to the caliph and acquainted him therewith so he bade him pouch a thousand dirhams and go and take him out of pawn. Thereupon the chamberlain returned to Abu Nawas, and paying his score, carried him to the caliph, who said, Make me some verses containing the words, O trusted of Allah, what may this be? Answered he, I hear and I obey, O commander of the faithful. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 32 Read by Lars Rolander Section 33 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 4, by Anonymous This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org reading by lars rolander the book of a thousand nights and a night volume four translated by richard burton section thirty three three hundred and fortieth night to three hundred and forty second night when it was the three hundred and fortieth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that abu novas answered i hear and i obey O commander of the faithful, and forthwith he improvised these couplets. Long was my night for sleepless misery, weary of body and of thought never free. I rose and in my palace walked a while, then wandered through the halls of haremry, till chanced I on a blackness which I found a white girl hid in hair for napery here to her for a moon of brightest sheen like willow wand and veiled in pudency i quaffed a cup to her then drew i near and kissed the beauty spot on cheek had she she woke a start and in her sleep's amaze swayed as the swaying branch in rain we see then rose and said to me o trusted one of allah o amin what may this be Quoth I, a guest that cometh to thy tents, and craves till morn thy hospitality. She answered, Gladly I, my lord, will grace, and honour such a guest with ear and eye. Cried the caliph, Allah strike thee dead, it is as if thou hadst been present with us. Then he took him by the hand, and carried him to the damsel, and when Abu Nova saw her, 
clad in a dress and veil of blue, he expressed abundant admiration, and improvised these couplets. Say to the pretty one in veil of blue, By Allah, O oh my life, have ruth on dole. For when the fair entreats her lover foul, Sighs rend his bosom and bespeak his soul. By charms of thee and whitest cheek I swear thee, Pity, a heart for love, lost all control. Bend to him, be his stay gainst stress of love, Nor aught except what saith the ribald fool. Now when he ended his verse, the damsel set wine before the caliph, and taking the lute played a lively measure, and sang these couplets. Wilt thou be just to others in thy love, and do, unwrite, and put me off, and take new friend in lieu? Had lovers Kasi unto whom I might complain, of thee he'd peradventure grant the due I sue. If thou forbid me pass your door, yet I afar will stand, and viewing you, waft my salams to you. The caliph bade her ply Abu Novas with wine, till he lost his right senses. Thereupon he gave him a full cup, and he drank a draught of it, and held the cup in his hand till he slept. Then the commander of the faithful bade the girl take the cup from his grasp and hide it. So she took it and set it between her thighs. Moreover, he drew his scimitar, and standing at the head of Abu Novas, pricked him with a point, whereupon he awoke, and saw the drawn sword and the caliph standing over him. At this sight the fumes of the wine fled from his head, and the caliph said to him, Make me some verses, and tell me therein what is become of thy cup, or I will cut off thy head. So he improvised these couplets. My tale indeed is tale unleaf. T'was yonder fawn who played the thief. She stole my cup of wine before, the sips and sups had dealt relief, and hid it in a certain place, my heart's desire and longing grief. I name it not for dread of him who hath of it command in chief. Quoth the caliph, Allah strike thee dead! How knewst thou that? But we accept what thou sayst. Then he ordered him a dress of honour and a thousand dinars, and he went away rejoicing. And among tales they tell is one of the man who stole the dish of gold wherein the dog ate. Sometimes erst there was a man who had accumulated debts, and his case was straightened upon him, so that he left his people and family, and went forth in distraction. And he ceased not wandering on at random, till he came after a time to a city tall of walls and firm of foundations. He entered it in a state of despondency and despair, harried by hunger and worn with the weariness of his way. As he passed through one of the main streets, he saw a company of the great going along, so he followed them till they reached a house like to a royal palace. He entered with them, and they stayed not faring forwards till they came in presence of a person seated at the upper end of a saloon, a man of the most dignified and majestic aspect, surrounded by pages and eunuchs, as he were of the sons of the Vasirs. When he saw the visitors, he rose to greet them, and received them with honour, but the poor man aforesaid was confounded at his own boldness, when beholding, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the three hundred and forty-first night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the poor man aforesaid was confounded at his own boldness, when beholding the goodliness of the place, and the crowd of servants and attendants, so drawing back in perplexity and fear for his life, sat down apart in a place far off, where none should see him. Now it chanced that whilst he was sitting, behold, in came a man with four sporting dogs, whereon were various kinds of raw silk and brocade, and wearing round their necks collars of gold with chains of silver, and tied up each dog in a place set privy for him, after which he went out, and presently returned with four dishes of gold, full of rich meats, which he set severally before the dogs, one for each. 
Then he went away and left them whilst the poor man began to eye the food for stress of hunger, and longed to go up to one of the dogs and eat with him, but fear of them withheld him. Presently one of the dogs looked at him, and Allah Almighty inspired the dog with the knowledge of his case, so he drew back from the platter and signed to the man who came and ate till he was filled. Then he would have withdrawn, but the dog again signed to him to take for himself the dish and what food was left in it, and pushed it towards him with his forepaw. So the man took the dish, and leaving the house, went his way, and none followed him. Then he journeyed to another city, where he sold the dish, and buying with a price a stock in trade, returned to his own town. There he sold his goods and paid his debts, and he throve and became affluent and rose to perfect prosperity. He abode in his own land, but after some years had passed he said to himself, Needs must I repair to the city of the owner of the dish, and carry him a fit and handsome present, and pay him the money value of that which his dog bestowed upon me. So he took the price of the dish, and a suitable gift, and setting out journeyed day and night, till he came to that city. He entered it, and sought the place where the man lived, but he found there not save ruins, mouldering in row and croak of crow, and house and home desolate, and all conditions in changed state. At this his heart and soul were troubled, and he repeated the saying of him who saith, Void are the private rooms of treasury, as void were hearts of fear and piety. Changed is the wadi, nor are its gazelles, those fawns, nor sandals, those I want to see, and of another. In sleep came Suada's shade and wakened me, near dawn when comrades all a-sleeping lay. But waking found I that the shade was fled, and saw air empty, and shrine far away. Now when the man saw these mouldering ruins, and witnessed what the hand of time had manifestly done with the place, leaving but traces of the substantial things that erewhiles had been, a little reflection made it needless for him to inquire of the case, so he turned away. Presently seeing a wretched man in a plight which made him shudder and feel goose-skin, and which would have moved the very rock to rush, he said to him, Ho thou! What have time and fortune done with the lord of this place? Where are his lovely faces, his shining full moons and splendid stars? And what is the cause of the ruin that is come upon his abode, so that nothing save the walls thereof remain? Quoth the other, He is the miserable thou seest mourning that which hath left him naked. But knowest thou not the words of the apostle? whom Allah bless and keep, wherein is a lesson to him who will learn by it, and a warning to whoso will be warned thereby, and guided in the right way. Verily it is the way of Allah Almighty to raise up nothing of this world, except he cast it down again. If thou question of the cause of this accident, indeed it is no wonder, considering the chances and changes of fortune. I was the lord of this place, and I built it, and founded it, and owned it, and I was the proud possessor of its full moons lucent, and its circumstance resplendent, and its damsels radiant, and its garniture magnificent. But time turned, and did away from me wealth and servants, and took from me what it had lent, not given, and brought upon me calamities which it held in store hidden. But there must needs be some reason for this thy question. So tell it me, and leave wondering. Thereupon the man who had waxed wealthy, being sore concerned, told him the whole story, and added, I have brought thee a present, such as souls desire, and the price of thy dish of gold which I took, for it was the cause of my affluence after poverty, and of the replenishment of my dwelling-place after desolation, and of the dispersion of my trouble and straitness. But the man shook his head, 
and weeping and groaning and complaining of his lot answered ho thou methinks thou art mad for this is not the way of a man of sense how should a dog of mine make generous gift to thee of a dish of gold and i meanly take back the price of what a dog gave this were indeed a strange thing were i in extremest unease and misery by allah i would not accept of thee in aught no not the worth of a nail paring so return whence thou camest in health and safety whereupon the merchant kissed his feet and taking leave of him returned whence he came praising him and reciting this couplet men and dogs together are all gone by so peace be with all of them dogs and men and allah is all-knowing again men tell the tale of the sharper of alexandria and the chief of police there was once in the coast fortress of alexandria a chief of police husam al-din hais the sharp scimitar of the faith now one night as he sat in his seat of office behold there came in to him a troop of white who said know o my lord the chief that i entered your city this night and alighted at such a khan and slept there till a third part of the night was past when i awoke and found my saddle-bags sliced open and a purse of a thousand gold pieces stolen from them no sooner had he done speaking than the chief summoned his chief officials and bade them lay hands on all in the khan and clap them in limbo till the morning and on the morrow he caused bring the rods and whips used in punishment and sending for the prisoners was about to flog them till they confessed in the presence of the owner of the stolen money when lo a man broke through the crowd till he came up to the chief of police and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the three hundred and forty-second night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that the chief was about to flog them when lo a man broke through the crowd till he came up to the chief of police and the trooper and said ho emir let these folk go for they are wrongously accused it was i who robbed this trooper and see here is the purse i stole from his saddle-bags so saying he pulled out the purse from his sleeve and laid it before husam al-din who said to the soldier take thy money and pouch it thou now hast no ground of complaint against the people of the khan thereupon these folk and all who were present fell to praising the thief and blessing him but he said ho emir the skill is not in that i came to thee in person and brought thee the purse the cleverness was in taking it a second time from this trooper asked the chief and how didst thou do take it o oh, sharper and the robber replied o emir i was standing in the shroff's bazaar at cairo when i saw this soldier receive the golden change and put it in yonder purse so i followed him from by street to by street but found no occasion of stealing it then he travelled from cairo and i followed him from town to town plotting and planning by the way to rob him but without avail till he entered this city and i dogged him to the khan i took up my lodging beside him and watched him till he fell asleep and i heard him sleeping when i went up to him softly softly and i slit open his saddle-bags with this knife and took the purse in the way i am now taking it so saying he put out his hand and took the purse from before the chief of police and the trooper both of whom together with the folk drew back watching him and thinking he would show them how he took the purse from the saddle-bags but behold he suddenly broke into a run and threw himself into a pool of standing water hard by so the chief of police shouted to his officers stop thief and many made after him but before they could doff their clothes and descend the steps he had made off and they sought for him but found him not for that the by-streets and lanes of alexandria all communicate so they came back without bringing the purse and the chief of police said to the trooper thou hast no demand upon the folk 
for thou fondest him who robbed thee and receivedest back thy money but didst not keep it so the trooper went away having lost his money whilst the folk were delivered from his hands and those of the chief of police and all this was of the favour of almighty allah and they also tell the tale of al malik al nasir and the three chiefs of police once upon a time al malik al nasir sent for the valis or chiefs of police of cairo bulak and fostat and said to them i desire each of you to recount me the marvellousest thing that hath befallen him during his term of office and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say end of section 33 read by lars rolander section 34 of the book of a thousand nights and a night volume 4 by anonymous this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org reading by lars rolander the book of a thousand nights and a night volume 4 translated by richard burton section 34 three hundred and forty third night to three hundred and forty sixth night when it was the three hundred and forty third night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that quoth al malik al nasir to the three valis i desire each of you to recount me the marvellousest thing that hath befallen him during his term of office so they answered we hear and we obey then said the chief of the police of cairo know thou o our lord the sultan the most wonderful thing that befell me during my term of office was on this wise and he began the story of the chief of police of cairo there were in this city two men of good repute fit to bear witness in matters of murder and wounds but they were both secretly addicted to intrigues with low women and to wine-bibbing and to dissolute doings nor could i succeed do what i would in bringing them to book and i began to despair of success so i charged the taverners and confectioners and fruitiers and candle chandlers and the keepers of brothels and bawdy houses to acquaint me of these two good men whenever they should anywhere be engaged in drinking or other debauchery or together or apart and ordered that if they both or if either of them bought at their shops aught for the purpose of basile and carousel the vendors should not conceal it from me and they replied we hear and obey presently it chanced that one night a man came to me and said o oh, my master know that the two just men the two witnesses are in such a street in such a house engaged in abominable wickedness so i disguised myself i and my body servant and ceased not trudging till i came to the house and knocked at the door whereupon a slave girl came out and opened to me saying who art thou i entered without answering her and saw the two legal witnesses and the housemaster sitting and lewd women by their side and before them great plenty of wine when they saw me they rose to receive me and made much of me seating me in the place of honour and saying to me welcome for an illustrious guest and welcome for a pleasant cup companion and on this wise they met me without showing a sign of alarm or trouble presently the master of the house arose from amongst us and went out and returned after a while with three hundred dinars when the men said to me without the least fear know o our lord the valley it is in thy power to do even more than disgrace and punish us but this will bring thee in return nothing but weariness so we reck thou wouldst do better to take this much money and protect us for almighty allah is named the protector and loveth those of his servants who protect their moslem neighbours 
and thou shalt have thy reward in this world, and you recompense in the world to come. So I said to myself, I will take the money and protect them this once, but if ever again I have them in my power, I will take my wreck of them, for, you see, the money had tempted me. Thereupon I took it, and went away, thinking that no one would know it. But next day, on a sudden, one of the Kazi's messengers came to me and said to me, O oh, Wali, be good enough to answer the summons of the Kazi, who wanteth thee. So I arose and accompanied him, knowing not the meaning of all this. And when I came into the judge's presence, I saw the two witnesses and the master of the house, who had given me the money sitting by his side. Thereupon this man rose, and sued me for three hundred dinars, nor was it in my power to deny the debt, for he produced a written obligation, and his two companions, the legal witnesses, testified against me that I owed the amount. Their evidence satisfied the Kazi, and he ordered me to pay the sum. Nor did I leave the court till they had of me the three hundred gold pieces. So I went away in the utmost wrath and shame, vowing mischief and vengeance against them, and repenting that I had not punished them. Such, then, is the most remarkable event which befell me during my term of office. Thereupon rose the chief of the Bulak police, and said, As for me, O our lord the Sultan, the most marvellous thing that happened to me since I became Wali was as follows, and he began the story of the chief of the Bulak police. I was once in debt to the full amount of three hundred thousand gold pieces, and being distressed thereby, I sold all that was behind me and what was before me, and all I hent in hand, but I could collect no more than an hundred thousand dinars. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the three hundred and forty-fourth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the wali of Bulak continued. So I sold all that was behind and before me, but could collect no more than an hundred thousand dinars, and remained in great perplexity. Now one night, as I sat at home in this state, behold, there came a knocking. So I said to one of my servants, See who is at the door. He went out and returned, one of face, changed in countenance, and with his side muscles a quivering. So I asked him, What aileth thee? And he answered, There is a man at the door. He is half naked, clad in skins, with sword in hand, and knife in girdle, and with him are a company of the same fashion, and he asketh for thee. So I took my sword, and going out to see who these were, behold, I found them as the boy had reported, and said to them, What is your business? They replied, Of a truth we be thieves, and have done fine work this night. So we appointed the swag to thy use, that thou mayst pay therewith the debts which sadden thee, and deliver thee from thy distress. Quoth I, Where is the plunder? and they brought me a great chest full of vessels of gold and silver, which, when I saw, I rejoiced and said to myself, Herewith I will settle all claims upon me, and there will remain as much again. So I took the money, and going inside said in my mind, It were ignoble to let them fare away empty-handed, whereupon I brought out the hundred thousand dinars I had by me, and gave it to them thanking them for their kindness, and they pouched the monies and went their way under cover of the night, so that none might know of them. But when morning dawned, I examined the contents of the chest, and found them copper and tin-washed, with gold worth five hundred dirhams at the most, and this was grievous to me, for I had lost what monies I had, and trouble was added to my trouble. Such, then, is the most remarkable event which befell me during my term of office. Then rose the chief of the police of old Cairo, and said, O oh, our lord the Sultan, the most marvellous thing that happened to me since I became Wali was on this wise. 
and he began the story the chief of the old Cairo police. I once hanged ten thieves, each on his own gibbet, and especially charged the guards to watch them and hinder the folk from taking any one of them down. Next morning, when I came to look at them, I found two bodies hanging from one gallows, and said to the guards, Who did this, and where is the tenth gibbet? But they denied all knowledge of it, and I was about to beat them till they owned the truth, when they said, Know, O Emir, that we fell asleep last night, and when we awoke we found that someone had stolen one of the bodies, gibbet and all. So we were alarmed and feared thy wrath. But behold, up came a peasant fellow driving his ass, whereupon we laid hands on him and killed him and hanged his body upon this gallows, in the stead of the thief who had been stolen. Now when I heard this, I marvelled and asked them, what had he with him and they answered he had a pair of saddle-bags on the ass quoth i what was in them quoth they we know not so i said bring them hither and when they brought them to me i bade open them behold therein was the body of a murdered man cut in pieces now as soon as i saw this i marvelled at the case and said in myself glory to god the cause of the hanging of this peasant was none other but his crime against this murdered man, and thy lord is not unjust towards his servants. And men also tell the tale of the thief and the shroff. A certain shroff, bearing a bag of gold pieces, once passed by a company of thieves, and one of these sharpers said to the others, I and I only have the power to steal yonder purse. So they asked, How wilt thou do it? And he answered, Look ye all, and followed the money changer till he entered his house, when he threw the bag on a shelf, and being affected with diabetes, went into the chapel of ease to do his want, calling to the slave girl, Bring me an ewer of water. She took the ewer and followed him to the privy, leaving the door open, whereupon the thief entered, and seizing the money-bag, made off with it to his companions, to whom he told what had passed. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the three hundred and forty-fifth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the thief took the money-bag, and made off with it to his companions, to whom he told what had passed. Said they, By Allah, thou hast played a clever trick. Tis not every one could do it. But presently the money-changer will come out of the privy, and missing the bag of money, he will beat the slave-girl, and torture her with grievous torture. Tis as though thou hast at present done nothing worthy of praise. So if thou be indeed a sharper, return and save the girl from being beaten and questioned. Quoth he, Inshallah, I will save both girl and purse. Then the prig went back to the shroff's house, and found him punishing the girl because of the purse. So he knocked at the door, and the man said, Who is there? cried the thief. I am the servant of thy neighbor in the exchange whereupon he came out to him and said, What is thy business? The thief replied, My master saluteth thee and saith to thee, Surely thou art deranged and thoroughly so, to cast the like of this bag of money down at the door of thy shop, and go away and leave it. Had a stranger hit upon it, he had made off with it, and, except my master had seen it and taken care of it, it had assuredly been lost to thee. So saying, he pulled out the purse, and showed it to the shroff, who on seeing it said, That is my very purse, and put out his hand to take it. But the thief said, By Allah, I will not give thee this same, till thou write me a receipt, declaring that thou hast received it, for indeed I fear my master will not believe that thou hast recovered the purse, unless I bring him thy writing to that effect, and sealed with thy signet seal. The money-changer went in to write the paper required, and in the meantime the thief made off with a bag of money, and thus was the slave-girl saved her beating. 
and men also tell a tale of the chief of the Kus police and the sharper. It is related that Allah al-Din, chief of police at Kus, was sitting one night in his house, when, behold, a personage of handsome appearance and dignified aspect came to the door, accompanied by a servant bearing a chest upon his head, and standing there said to one of the Wali's young men, Go in and tell the emir that I would have audience of him on some privy business. So the servant went in and told his master, who bade admit the visitor. When he entered, the emir saw him to be a man of handsome semblance and portly presence. So he received him with honor and high distinction, seating him beside himself, and said to him, What is thy wish? replied the stranger. I am a highwayman, and I am minded to repent at thy hands, and turn to Almighty Allah. But I would have thee help me to this, for that I am in thy district, and under thine inspection. Now I have here a chest, wherein are matters worth some forty thousand dinars, and none hath so good a right to it as thou, so do thou take it, and give me in exchange a thousand dinars of thine own monies lawfully gotten, that I may have a little capital to aid me in my repentance, and save me from resorting to sin for my subsistence, and with Allah Almighty be thy reward. Speaking thus, he opened the chest, and showed the wali that it was full of trinkets and jewels and bullion and ring-gems and pearls, whereat he was amazed and rejoiced with great joys. So he cried out to his treasurer, saying, Bring hither a certain purse containing a thousand dinars. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the three hundred and forty-sixth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the wali cried out to his treasurer, saying, Bring hither a certain purse containing a thousand dinars and gave it to the highwayman, who took it, and thanking him, went his way under cover of the night. Now, when it was the morrow, the emir sent for the chief of the goldsmiths, and showed him the chest, and what was therein. But the goldsmith found it nothing but tin and brass, and the jewels and bezel stones and pearls all of glass, whereat the valley was sore chagrined, and sent in quest of the highwayman but none could come at him. And men also tell the tale of Ibrahim bin al-Mahdi and the merchant's sister. The caliph al maamun once said to his uncle Ibrahim bin al-Mahdi, Tell us the most remarkable thing that thou hast ever seen. Answered he, I hear and obey. O commander of the faithful, know that I rode out one day a pleasuring, and my ride brought me to a place where I smelt the reek of food. So my soul longed for it, and I halted. O prince of true believers, perplexed and unable either to go on or to go in. Presently I raised my eyes, and lo! I espied a lattice window, and behind it a wrist, then which I never beheld aught lovelier. The sight turned my brain, and I forgot the smell of the food, and began to plan a plot how I should get access to the house. After a while I observed a tailor hard by, and going up to him saluted him. He returned my salam, and I asked him, Whose house is that? And he answered, It belongeth to a merchant called such an one, son of such an one, who consorteth with none save merchants. As we were talking, behold, up came two men of comely aspect, with intelligent countenances, riding on horseback. And the tailor told me that they were the merchant's most intimate friends, and acquainted me with their names. So I urged my beast towards them, and said to them, Be I your ransom, Abu Fulan awaiteth you. And I rode with them both to the gate where I entered, and they also. Now when the master of the house saw me with them, he doubted not but I was their friend. So he welcomed me, and seated me in the highest stead. 
Then they brought the table of food, and I said in myself, Allah hath granted me my desire of the food, and now there remained the hand and the wrist. After a while we removed for carousel to another room, which I found tricked out with all manner of rarities, and the host paid me particular attention, addressing his talk to me, for that he took me to be a guest of his guests. Whilst in like manner these two made much of me, taking me for a friend of their friend, the housemaster. Thus I was the object of politest attentions till we had drunk several cups of wine, and there came in to us a damsel, as she were a willow wand, of the utmost beauty and elegance, who took a lute and playing a lively measure, sang these couplets. Is it not strange one house us two contain? and still thou drawest not near, or talk we twain. Only our eyes tell secrets of our souls, and broken hearts by lovers' fiery pain. Winks with the eyelids, signs the eyebrow knows, languishing looks and hands saluting fain. When I heard these words, my vitals were stirred, O commander of the faithful, and I was moved to delight for her excessive loveliness and the beauty of the verses she sang and i envied her her skill and said there lacketh somewhat to thee o damsel whereupon she threw the lute from her hand in anger and cried since when are ye wont to bring ill-mannered louts into your assemblies then i repented of what i had done seeing the company vexed with me and i said in my mind my hopes are lost by me, and I weeted no way of escaping blame, but to call for a lute, saying, I will show you what escaped her in the air she played. Quoth the folk, We hear and obey. So they brought me a lute, and I tuned the strings and sang these verses. This is thy friend perplexed for pain and pine, than a moor down whose breast coarse drops of brine. He hath this hand to the compassionate raised, for winning wish, and that of hearts is lean. O thou who seest one love perishing, his death is caused by those hands and eyne. Whereupon the damsel sprang up, and throwing herself at my feet, kissed them, and said, It is thine to excuse, O my master. By Allah, I knew not thy quality, nor heard I ever the like of this performance. And all began extolling me, and making much of me, being beyond measure delighted. And at last they besought me to sing again. So I sang a merry air, whereupon they all became drunken with music and wine. Their wits left them, and they were carried off to their homes, while I abode alone with the host and the girl. He drank some cups with me, and then said, O oh, my lord, my life hath been lived in vain, for that I have not known the like of thee till the present. Now, by Allah, tell me who thou art, that I may ken who is the cup companion whom Allah has bestowed on me this night. At first I returned him evasive answers, and would not tell him my name. But he conjured me till I told him who I was, whereupon he sprang to his feet. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 34 Read by Lars Rolander Section 35 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night Volume 4 by Anonymous this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jean Dauphrio. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 4. Translated by Richard Burton. Section 35. Three hundred and forty seventh night to three hundred and fiftieth night. When it was the three hundred and forty-seventh night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Ibrahim, son of Almadi, continued, 
Now when the housemaster heard my name, he sprang to his feet and said, Indeed, I wondered that such gifts should belong to any but the like of thee, and fortune hath done me a good turn for which I cannot thank her too much. But happily, this is a dream, for how could I hope that one of the caliphate house should visit my humble home and carouse with me this night? I conjured him to be seated, so he sat down and began to question me as to the cause of my visit in the most courteous terms. So I told him the whole affair, first and last, hiding not, and said to him, Now as to the food I have had my will, but of the hand and wrist I have still to win my wish, quoth he, Thou shalt have thy desire of the hand and wrist also, inshallah. Then said he to the slave girl, Ho, oh, such an one, bid such an one come down. And he called his slave girls down, one by one, and showed them to me. But I saw not my mistress among them, and he said, O oh, my lord, there is none left save my mother and sister, but, by Allah, I must needs have them also down and show them to thee. So I marveled at his courtesy and large-heartedness, and said, May I be thy sacrifice, begin with the sister. And he answered, With joy and good will. So she came down, and he showed me her hand, and behold, she was the owner of the hand and wrist. Quoth I, Allah, make me thy ransom. This is the damsel whose hand and wrist I saw at the lattice. Then he sent his servants without stay or delay for witnesses, and bringing out two myriads of gold pieces, said to the witnesses, This our lord and master, Ibrahim, son of Almadi, paternal uncle of the commander of the faithful, seeketh in marriage my sister, such an one, and I call you to witness that I give her in wedlock to him, and that he hath settled upon her ten thousand dinars. And he said to me, I give thee my sister in marriage, at the portion aforesaid. I consent, answered I, and am herewith content. Whereupon he gave one of the bags to her and the other to the witnesses, and said to me, O our Lord, I desire to adorn a chamber for thee, where thou mayst sleep with thy wife. But I was abashed at his generosity, and was ashamed to lie with her in his house. So I said, Equip her and send her to my place. And by thy being, O commander of the faithful, he sent me with her such an equipage that my house, for all its greatness, was too straight to hold it. And I begot on her this boy that standeth in thy presence. Then al Mamun marveled at the man's generosity, and said, Gifted of Allah is he, never heard I of his like. And he bade Ibrahim bin al-Mahdi bring him to court, that he might see him. He brought him, and the caliph conversed with him, and his wit and good breeding so pleased him, that he made him one of his chief officers. And Allah is the giver, the bestower. Men also relate the tale of the woman whose hands were cut off for giving alms to the poor. A certain king once made proclamation to the people of his realm, saying, If any of you give alms of aught, I will verily and assuredly cut off his hand. Wherefore all the people abstained from alms deed, and none could give anything to any one. Now it chanced that one day a beggar accosted a certain woman, and indeed hunger was sore upon him, and said to her, Give me an alms. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was three hundred and forty-eighth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that, quoth the beggar to the woman, Give me an alms, however small. But she answered him, How can I give thee aught, when the king cutteth off the hands of all who give alms? Then he said, I conjure thee by Allah Almighty, give me an alms. So when he adjured her by the holy name of Allah, she had ruth on him and gave him two scones. The king heard of this, whereupon he called her before him and cut off her hands, after which she returned to her house. Now it chanced after a while that the king said to his mother, I have a mind to take a wife, so do thou marry me to a fair woman. Quoth she, there is among our female slaves one who is unsurpassed in beauty, but she hath a grievous blemish. The king asked, What is that? And his mother answered, She hath had both her hands cut off. Said he, Let me see her. 
So she brought her to him. And he was ravished by her, and married her, and went in unto her, and begat upon her a son. Now this was the woman who had given two scones as an alms to the asker, and whose hands had been cut off therefore. And when the king married her, her fellow wives envied her, and wrote to the common husband that she was an unchaste, having just given birth to the boy. So he wrote to his mother, bidding her carry the woman into the desert, and leave her there. The old queen obeyed his commandment, and abandoned the woman and her son in the desert. Whereupon she fell to weeping for that which had befallen her, and wailing with exceeding sore wail. As she went along, she came to a river, and knelt down to drink, being overcome with excess of thirst, for fatigue of walking, and for grief. But as she bent her head, the child which was at her neck fell into the water. Then she sat weeping bitter tears for her child, and as she wept, behold, came up two men, who said to her, What maketh thee weep? Quoth she, I had a child at my neck, and he hath fallen into the water. They asked, Wilt thou that we bring him out to thee? And she answered, Yes. So they prayed to Almighty Allah, and the child came forth of the water to her, safe and sound. Then they said, Wilt thou that Allah restore thee thy hands as they were? Yes, replied she. Whereupon they prayed to Allah, Extolled and exalted be he. And her hands were restored to her, goodlier than before. Then said they, Knowest thou who we are? And she replied, Allah is all-knowing. And they said, We are thy two scones of bread which thou gayest in alms to the asker, and which were the cause of the cutting off of thy hands. So praise thou Allah Almighty, for that he hath restored to thee thy hands and thy child. Then she praised Almighty Allah, and glorified him. And men relate a tale of the devout Israelite. There was once a devout man of the children of Israel, whose family span cotton thread and he used every day to sell the yarn and buy fresh cotton, and with the profit he laid in daily bread for his household. One morning he went out and sold the day's yarn as want, when there met him one of his brethren, who complained to him of need. So he gave him the price of the thread and returned empty-handed to his family, who said to him, Where is the cotton and the food? Quoth he, Such an one met me and complained to me of want whereupon I gave him the price of the yarn. And they said, How shall we do? We have nothing to sell. Now they had a cracked trencher and a jar. So he took them to the bazaar, but none would buy them of him. However, presently, as he stood in the market, there passed by a man with a fish. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the three hundred and forty-ninth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the man took the trencher and jar to the bazaar, but none would buy them of him. However, there presently passed by a man with a fish, which was so stinking and so swollen that none would buy it of him. And he said to the Jew, Wilt thou sell me thine unsaleable ware for mine? Yes, answered the Jew and giving him the wooden trencher and jar, took the fish, and carried it home to his family, who said, What shall we do with this fish? Quoth he, We will broil it and eat it, till it please Allah to provide bread for us. So they took it, and ripping open its belly, found therein a great pearl, and told the head of the household, who said, See ye if it be pierced, if so, it belongeth to some one of the folk. If not, tis a provision of Allah for us. So they examined it, and found it unpierced. Now when it was the morrow, the Jew carried it to one of his brethren, which was an expert in jewels. And the man asked, O such an one, whence hadst thou this pearl? Whereto the Jew answered, It was a gift of Almighty Allah to us. And the other said, It is worth a thousand dirhams, and I will give thee that. But take it to such an one, for he hath more money and skill than I. So the Jew took it to the jeweler, who said, It is worth seventy thousand dirhams, and no more. Then he paid him that sum, and the Jew hired two porters to carry the money to his house. 
As he came to his door, a beggar accosted him, saying, Give me that of which Allah hath given thee. Quoth the Jew to the asker, But yesterday we were even as thou. Take thee half this money. So he made two parts of it, and each took his half. Then said the beggar, Take back thy money, and Allah bless and prosper thee in it. I am a messenger, whom thy Lord hath sent to try thee. Quoth the Jew, To Allah be the praise and the thanks, and abode in all delight of life, he and his household till death. And men recount this story of Abu Hassan al-Ziadi and the Khurasan. Quoth Abu Hassan al-Ziadi, I was once in straitened case, and so needy, that the grocer, the baker, and other tradesmen donned and importuned me. And my misery became extreme, for I knew of no resource, nor what to do. Things being on this wise, there came to me one day certain of my servants, and said to me, At the door is a pilgrim white, who seeketh admission to thee. Quoth I, Admit him. So he came in, and behold, he was a Khorasani. We exchanged salutations, and he said to me, Tell me, art thou Abu Hassan al-Ziadi? And I replied, Yes, what is thy wish? Quoth he, I am a stranger, and am minded to make the pilgrimage. But I have with me a great sum of money, which is burdensome to bear. So I wish to deposit these ten thousand dirhams with thee, whilst I make my pilgrimage, and return. If the caravan march back, and thou see me not, then know that I am dead, in which case the money is a gift from me to thee. But if I come back, it shall be mine. I answered, Be it as thou wilt, and thus please Allah Almighty. So he brought out a leather bag, and I said to the servant, Fetch the scales. And when he brought them, the man weighed out the money and handed it to me, after which he went his way. Then I called the purveyors and paid them my liabilities. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the three hundred and fiftieth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that quoth Abu Hassan al-Ziadi, I called the purveyors, and paid them my liabilities, and spent freely and amply, saying to myself, By the time he returns, Allah will have relieved me with one or other of the bounties he hath by him. However, on the very next day, the servant came in to me and said, Thy friend the Khorasan man is at the door. Admit him, answered I. So he came in and said to me, I had purposed to make the pilgrimage, but the news hath reached me of the decease of my father, and I have resolved to return. So give me the monies I deposited with thee yesterday. When I heard this, I was troubled and perplexed beyond measure of perplexity known to man, and wotted not what reply to make him. For, if I denied it, he would put me on my oath, and I should be disgraced in the world to come, whilst, if I told him that I had spent the money, he would make an outcry and dishonor me before men. So I said to him, Allah give thee health, this my house is no stronghold nor site of safe custody for this money. When I received thy leather bag, I sent it to one with whom it now is. So do thou return to us to-morrow, and take thy money, inshallah. So he went away, and I passed the night in great concern, because of his return to me. Sleep visited me not, nor could I close my eyes. So I rose, and bade the boy saddle me the she-mule. Answered he, O oh, my lord, it is yet but the first third of the night, and indeed we have hardly had time to rest. I returned to my bed. But sleep was forbidden to me, and I ceased not to awaken the boy. And he to put me off, till break of day, when he saddled me the mule, and I mounted and rode out, not knowing whither to go. I threw the reins on the mule's shoulder, and gave myself up to regrets and melancholy thoughts, whilst she fared on with me to the eastward of Baghdad. Presently as I went along, behold, I saw a number of people approaching me, and turned aside into another path to avoid them. But seeing that I wore a turban in preacher fashion, they followed me, and hastening up to me, said, Knowest thou the lodging of Abu Hassan al-Ziadi? I am he, answered I. And they rejoined, Obey the summons of the commander of the faithful. Then they carried me before al-Mamun, who said to me, 
Who art thou? Quoth I, an associate of the Kazi Abu Yusuf, and a doctor of the law and traditions. Asked the Caliph, By what surname art thou known? And I answered, Abu Hassan al-Ziyadi. Whereupon, quoth he, Expound to me thy case. So I recounted to him my case, and he wept sore, and said to me, Out on thee, the Apostle of Allah, whom Allah bless and assain, would not let me sleep this night because of thee, for in early darkness he appeared to me and said, Succor Abu Hassan al-Ziyadi, whereupon I awoke, and, knowing thee not, went to sleep again. But he came to me a second time and said to me, Woe to thee, Sakr Abu Hassan al-Ziyadi. I awoke a second time, but knowing thee not, I went to sleep again. And he came to me a third time, and still I knew thee not, and went to sleep again. Then he came to me once more and said, Out on thee, Sakr Abu Hassan al-Ziyadi. After that I dared not sleep any more, but watched the rest of the night, and aroused my people, and sent them on all sides in quest of thee. Then he gave me one myriad of dirhams, saying, this is for the Khorasani, and other ten thousand, saying, Spend freely of this, and amend thy case therewith, and set thine affairs in order. Moreover, he presented me with thirty thousand dirhams, saying, Furnish thyself with this, and when the procession day is being kept, come thou to me, that I may invest thee with some office. So I went forth from him with the money, and returned home, where I prayed the dawn prayer, and behold, presently came the Khorasani. So I carried him into the house, and brought out to him one myriad of dirhams, saying, Here is thy money. Quoth he, It is not my very money, how cometh this? So I told him the whole story, and he wept, and said, By Allah, hadst thou told me the fact at first, I had not pressed thee. And now, by Allah, I will not accept aught of this money. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 35。Section 36 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 4, by Anonymous. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 4. Translated by Richard Burton. Section 36. 351st Night to 353rd Night. When it was the 351st Night, she said, it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that quoth the Khorasani to al Siyadi, By Allah, hadst thou told me the fact at first, I had not pressed thee, and now by Allah I will not accept aught of this money, and thou art lawfully quit of it. So saying, he went away, and I set my affairs in order, and repaired on the procession day to al Ma'amun's gate, where I found him seated. When he saw me present myself, he called me to him, and, bringing forth to me a paper from under his prayer carpet, said to me, This is a patent, conferring on thee the office of Kasi of the western division of al Medina, the holy city, from the Bab al-Salam, to the furthest limit of the township. And I appoint thee such and such monthly allowances. So fear Allah to whom be honour and glory, and be mindful of the solicitude of his apostle, who may he bless and keep on thine account. Then the folk marvelled at the caliph's words, and asked me their meaning, whereupon I told them the story from beginning to end, and it spread abroad amongst the people. And quoth he who telleth the tale, Abu Hassan al-Siyadi ceased not to be Kasi of al-Medina, the holy city, till he died in the days of al-Ma'amun, the mercy of Allah be on him. And among the tales men tell is one of the poor man and his friend in need. 
There was once a rich man who lost all he had, and became destitute, whereupon his wife advised him to ask aid and assistance of one of his intimates. So he betook himself to a certain friend of his, and acquainted him with his necessities, and he lent him five hundred dinars to trade withal. Now in early life he had been a jeweller, so he took the gold and went to the jeweled bazaar, where he opened a shop to buy and sell. Presently, as he sat in his shop, three men accosted him, and asked for his father, and when he told them that he was deceased, they said, Say, did he leave issue? Quoth the jeweller, He left the slave who is before you. They asked, And who knoweth thee for his son? And he answered, The people of the bazaar. Whereupon they said, Call them together here, that they may testify to us that thou art his very son. So he called them, and they bore witness of this, whereupon the three men delivered to him a pair of saddle-bags, containing thirty thousand dinars, besides jewels and bullion of high value, saying, This was deposited with us in trust by thy father. Then they went away, and presently there came to him a woman who sought of him certain of the jewels, worth five hundred dinars, which she bought and paid him three thousand for them. Upon this he arose and took five hundred dinars, and carrying them to his friend who had lent him the money, said to him, Take the five hundred dinars I borrowed of thee, for Allah hath opened to me the gate of prosperity. Quoth the other, Nay, I gave them to thee outright for the love of Allah, so do thou keep them, and take this paper, but read it not till thou be at home, and do according to that which is therein. So he took the money and the paper, and returned home, where he opened the scroll, and found therein inscribed these couplets. Kinsmen of mine were those three men who came to thee, my sire and uncles twain and sali bin ali so what for cash thou coldest to my mother twas thou soldest it and coin and gems were sent by me thus doing i desired not any harm to thee but in my presence spare thee and thy modesty and they also recount the story of the ruined man who became rich again through a dream there lived once in Baghdad a wealthy man, and made of money, who lost all his substance and became so destitute that he could earn his living only by hard labor. One night he lay down to sleep, dejected and heavy-hearted, and saw in a dream a speaker who said to him, Verily thy fortune is in Cairo, go thither and seek it. So he set out for Cairo, but when he arrived there, evening overtook him, and he lay down to sleep in a mosque. Presently, by decree of Allah Almighty, a band of bandits entered the mosque, and made their way thence into an adjoining house. But the owners, being aroused by the noise of the thieves, awoke and cried out, whereupon the chief of police came to their aid with his officers. The robbers made off. But the Vali entered the mosque, and finding the man from Baghdad asleep there, laid hold of him, and beat him with palm-rods, so grievous a beating that he was well-nigh dead. Then they cast him into jail, where he abode three days, after which the chief of police sent for him, and asked him, Whence art thou? And he answered, From Baghdad, quoth the Vali, and what brought thee to Cairo? And quoth the Baghdadi, I saw in a dream one who said to me, Thy fortune is in Cairo, go thither to it. But when I came to Cairo, the fortune which he promised me proved to be the palm-rods thou so generously gavest to me. The Vali laughed till he showed his wisdom teeth, and said, Of man of little wit, thrice have I seen in a dream one who said to me, There is in Baghdad a house in such a district, and of such a fashion, and its courtyard is laid out garden-wise, at the lower end whereof is a jetting fountain, and under the same a great sum of money lieth buried. Go thither, and take it. Yet I went not, but thou of the briefness of thy wit hast journeyed from place to place, 
on the faith of a dream which was but an idle galimatias of sleep then he gave him money saying help thee back herewith to thine own country and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the three hundred and fifty-second night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that the wali gave the baghdad man some silver saying help thee back herewith to thine own country and he took the money and set out upon his homewards march now the house the wali had described was the man's own house in baghdad so the wayfarer returned thither and digging underneath the fountain in his garden discovered a great treasure and thus allah gave him abundant fortune and a marvellous coincidence occurred and a story is also current of caliph al mutawakkil and his concubine mabuba there were in the palace of the caliph al mutawakkil al allah four thousand concubines whereof two thousand were greeks and other two thousand slave-born arabians and abyssinians and obaid ibn tahir had given him two hundred white girls and a like number of abyssinian and native girls among these slave-borns was a girl of bassorah hight mabuba the beloved who was of surpassing beauty and loveliness elegance and voluptuous grace moreover she played upon the lute and was skilled in singing and making verses and wrote a beautiful hand so that al mutawakkil fell passionately in love with her and could not endure from her a single hour but when she saw this affection she presumed upon his favour to use him arrogantly wherefore he waxed exceeding wroth with her and forsook her forbidding the people of the palace to speak with her she abode on this wise some days but the caliph still inclined to her and he arose one morning and said to his courtiers i dreamt last night that i was reconciled to mabuba they answered would allah this might be on wake and as they were talking behold in came one of the caliph's maidservants and whispered him so he rose from his throne and entered the seraglio for the whisper had said of a truth we heard singing and lute-playing in mabuba's chamber and we knew not what this meant so he went straight to her apartment where he heard her playing upon the lute and singing the following verses i wander through the palace but i sight there not a soul to whom i may complain or will change a word with me it is as though i done so grievous rebel deed wherefrom can no contrition ever avail to set me free have we no intercessor here to plead with king who came in sleep to me and took me back to grace and amity but when the break of day arose and showed itself again then he departing sent me back to dream my privacy now when the caliph heard her voice he marvelled at the verse and yet more at the strange coincidence of their dreams and entered the chamber as soon as she perceived him she hastened to rise and throw herself at his feet and kissing them said by allah o my lord this hap is what i dreamt last night and when i awoke i made the couplets thou hast heard replied al mutawakkil by allah i also dreamt the like then they embraced and made friends and he abode with her seven days with their nights now mabuba had written upon her cheek in musk the caliph's name which was jaafar and when he saw this he improvised the following one wrote upon her cheek with musk his name was jaafar Hais. my soul for hers who wrote upon her cheek the name i sight if an her fingers have inscribed one line upon her cheek full many a line in heart of mine those fingers did indite o thou whom jaafar's soul of men possesses for himself allah fill jaafar's stream full draught the wine of thy delight when al mutawakkil died his host of women forgot him all save mabuba and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. 
When it was the three hundred and fifty-third night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when al-Mutawakkil died, his host of women forgot him, all save Mabuba, who ceased not to mourn for him, till she deceased and was buried by his side. The mercy of Allah be on them both. And men also tell the tale of Vardant the Butcher, his adventure with the lady and the bear. There lived once in Cairo, in the days of Caliph al-Hakim b. Amrilla, a butcher named Vardan, who dealt in sheep's flesh, and there came to him every day a lady and gave him a dinar, whose weight was nigh two and a half Egyptian dinars, saying, Give me a lamb. So he took the money and gave her the lamb, which she delivered to a porter she had with her and he put it in his crate, and she went away with him to her own place. Next day she came in the forenoon, and this went on for a long time, the butcher gaining a dinar by her every day, till at last he began to be curious about her case, and said to himself, This woman buyeth of me a ducat worth of meat every morning, paying ready money, and never misseth a single day. Verily this is a strange thing. So he took an occasion of questioning the porter in her absence, and asked him, Whither goest thou every day with yonder woman? And he answered, I know not what to make of her for surprise, inasmuch as every day after she hath taken the lamb of thee, she buyeth necessaries of the table, fresh and dried fruits and wax candles, a dinar's worth, and taketh of a certain person, which is a Nazarene, two flagons of wine, worth another dinar, and then she leadeth me with a hole, and I go with her to the Vazir's gardens, where she blindfoldeth me, so that I cannot see on what part of earth I set my feet, and taking me by the hand she leadeth me I know not whither. Presently she saith, Set down here, and when I have done so, she giveth me an empty crate she hath ready, and, taking my hand, leadeth me back to the Vasi's gardens, the place where she bound my eyes, and there removeth the bandage, and giveth me ten silver bits. Allah be your helper, quoth Vardan, but he redoubled in curiosity about her case. Disquietude increased upon him, and he passed the night in exceeding restlessness. And quoth the butcher, Next morning she came to me of a custom, and taking the lamb, for which she paid the dinar, delivered it to the porter, and went away. So I gave my shop in charge to a lad, and followed her without her seeing me. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 36 Read by Lars Rolander